So tonight we have uh, Pranay Lal, who's going to give us um, a talk about his his latest book, which is called Invisible Empire, The Natural History of Viruses. Now, Pranay is a biochemist who works for a nonprofit organization on, uh, for public health. But he's also worked as a caricaturist in, in, on, in newspapers, an animator for advertising agencies, and he's also a very strong environmental campaigner. His first book was called Indica, which is a deep natural history of the, of the, of the Indian subcontinent. And this won the Best Nonfiction Debut Award at the Tata Literary Fest in 2017. So the natural history of viruses, it is his latest book, Invisible Empire, was released in November 2021. And it's, it is unfortunately not available in the United Kingdom yet, but I expect it will be quite soon. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your take on viruses and hear, hearing your take on, on this, this thing, which many of us never even thought about until the last couple of years. It's something that's really taken over everybody's life. So Frane, thank you so much for taking the time and coming along and it's over to you. Thank you, Santi. Thank you, Padma, for inviting me and making me part of uh, this lecture series. I think uh, um, I'm going to speak with some trepidation. Of course, uh, there's some very, very uh, learned people who know perhaps more about the natural world or at least uh, uh, certain aspects about which I have been talking or writing about. But as a biochemist, uh, I have deep interest in uh, both the natural world and uh, uh, the microbial world, something that I work on on a daily basis. Um, I'm going to um, start, yeah, with this slide. Um, uh, as Sandy said, that you know we are in um, in a very strange period uh, in 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 the modern time. Uh, in 2018, the Nobel Prize for uh, Medicine. Uh, came as an incredible surprise. And it also brought in the promise that we are going to possibly usher in new treatments for diseases that looked intractable. And, but then just a year later, uh, in December 2019, with the outbreak of the current pandemic, uh, we saw that the fervor and the interest and, and the language and the narrative uh, towards public health and in particular the microbial world had changed. Everything that we spoke about with uh, utter confidence and looking at things in, in a positive purview was now changed and we were now castigating things and labeling things uh, just as we did in the mid 19th century. And this image is not something very different than what we are in today. This is an image of uh, encyclopedia from uh, 1880, a French encyclopedia for uh, good housewives. And it actually shows three children suffering from three diseases, scarlet fever, measles, and smallpox. Uh, the reason why I show this image is because for us, the microbes, bacteria, viruses, and the like are something that only cause disease. And we do not look at the larger contributions that they make to uh, the life um, uh, or, or nature's processes per se. I'm going to take the contrarian view and I'm going to try positing five cases to you in, in the hope that I'm able to convince that microbes and viruses in particular are extremely essential for the way life exists today and for life to exist in the future. So I'm going to come to uh, uh, trying to tell you what exactly is a virus, but I mean, it's, there's no classical definition for it. I'm just going to try taking uh, you to a journey of what the microbial world looks like. And within that, uh, where do microbes fit in? So let's imagine that we take a pinch of soil from uh, you know, a place where uh, water meets soil, say a pond or, or a bird bath. And if we were to take a generous pinch and put it under a microscope, chances are that we would find a microscopic worm which looked something like this. And this is a nematode. Nematode is perhaps uh, 
the most uh, abundant macro creature, uh, a, a creature uh, which is macroscopic uh, and uh, uh, multicellular, and perhaps the most abundant creature in the world. They're, they, it's estimated there are 57 billion nematodes to every human. Um, and it's, they're, they're, they're beautiful creatures. They're translucent and they look very pretty under a light microscope. If I were to just change the field of the microscope and look around a little more, I would possibly find a clutch of these slipper-shaped uh, translucent creatures, which are called paramecians or, or their cousins. You know, it could be an amoeba or something like that. So the next creature in terms of size is perhaps a protozoan and uh, something like this, which we have seen in our school days, uh, is pretty common to see. Next, uh, if you were to just uh, look around the field of microscope, uh, turn, uh, turn our lens uh, in and around, and we would see a creature something like this. This is an algae, uh, algal cell. Uh, it's called micro asterias or a small sun. It's beautiful. It, it, uh, under refracted light, it, it can show dazzling colors. It's a solitary uh, algal body that uh, lives and divides into uh, two, and that's how it replicates. It's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful thing to look under a microscope. Uh, if I were to sharpen my focus a little and, uh, you know, by uh, magnify it uh, 10 times, I would look at something like this. Uh, you know, this is in the foreground, you see these what look like um, uh, dandelion uh, or tridax heads. Uh, these are not flowers, but these are uh, actually uh, fungal strands, and it's aspergillus. Uh, some of uh, the members of the aspergillus family are pretty deadly, uh, but they, uh, this one, this particular one is not. In the background, you see something that looks like a uh, faint sun. Uh, that's a solitary uh, yeast cell, Saccharomyces, and it's been stained uh, in gram staining, of course, um, let me just say that, you know, I'm not looking at the same field. Uh, this is not from a single uh, confocal lens, a field that, that has been taken. These are separate images taken from separate uh, 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 microbial or microscopic uh, studies. So it's just, in, uh, just to bring together that what, what is it that you should expect to see when you are looking through a microscope. So that the cell that you see in the back uh, is uh, Saccharomyces, the yeast cell. And this is a pretty large bacteria and it's sometimes found in colonies and often solitary as well. What is interesting is the bacteria is something that is attacked very commonly by something what is called a bacteriophage. Bacterio is bacteria, phage is to eat in Greek. And these are viruses. They look like uh, space landers, they look like uh, uh, space uh, uh, vehicles that have just landed on a planet and it actually plays out quite like that. You have a clutch of these viruses attacking, trying to make sure that their genome is the first to reach uh, inside the cell of this bacteria and they're able to create more of their kind. Just to uh, stress a little more on the size bit, uh, on the extreme right of your screen, you see a strand of hair. Uh, that's, uh, of course, uh, hair also is relative. I mean, even in a human body, there are at least eight different kinds of hair. And even across, uh, you know, individuals, the thickness of hair is quite variable. So, uh, and just let, let's say this is the standard hair, uh, the, the average hair. And if you were to move towards the left of your screen, you would notice uh, two discs which are orange colored, and that's the red blood cell. Uh, let's move a little to the left and you see this uh, gray green colored sphere. That's a dust particle. And to the left of it are two blue uh, colored uh, sausage shaped bacterium. To the left of that is perhaps the smallest commonly occurring particle and that's the wildfire smoke. It's extremely, extremely tiny. It persists in the air for a very, very long time. Now to the left of the wildfire uh, particle is the deep orange or magenta colored uh, dot that you see, and that's the coronavirus. Coronavirus is a large virus, 
it's not the largest virus, but it's just put there for reference sake for the moment. But to the left of the coronavirus is the bacteriophage, the, the, the one that I showed you uh, previously. The, now, the bacteriophage is something that is can be pretty large. And for each known bacteria, we have found a bacteriophage. And again, to the left of a bacteriophage is one of the smallest known viruses. It's the Zika virus. The Zika and polio are, uh, viruses are comparable and they're pretty, pretty small. So let's move on uh, to what I wanted to talk about size. I mean, we are still on the topic of size. Now, in 1992, something remarkable happened in the city of Bradford. Now, Bradford is what, about 280 kilometers north of London, if I'm right. Uh, now, Bradford is, uh, as you know, in the middle of Yorkshire, uh, made famous in India by Jeffrey Boycott. But of course, this town of Bradford is famous for, I think, Jack the Ripper. Uh, but in 1994, this uh, uh, a creature was discovered. Uh, they didn't know what it was. And this was something that was found uh, in a cooling tower of a hospital. A mysterious fever had emerged in the post-operative uh, ward of a hospital in Bradford. A microbiologist by the name of uh, Timothy Robotham was uh, assigned to find out what could be the causative agent. When he went to the cooling towers and isolated this creature, he wasn't sure what this was. To him, it looked like a bacteria. It looked perfectly square, uh, uh, round, quite like a, a, a cell of yeast, uh, Saccharomyces. And when he stained it, what is called gram staining, in which uh, you use two dyes to decide uh, or to determine whether uh, a microbe or bacteria is gram positive or gram, gram negative, uh, it showed both the colors. So this was pretty confounding. And uh, uh, Robotham was not sure what this was. And he tried culturing it. Uh, what culturing is, is basically a process where you try to grow and replicate uh, a creature, uh, a bacteria in particular, that you want to isolate and try growing so that you can do more tests on it. But this proved uh, pretty recalcitrant. It uh, only in liquid form, in liquid uh, medium, uh, uh, medium which is rich in nutrients, did this creature uh, grow. So it was very, very difficult for him to figure out what this was. And he tried and, and he failed. Thankfully, the, the outbreak that took place in and around the hospital was not so serious. And this uh, uh, line of research was abandoned because the NHS around that time was uh, pretty low on resources. So Timothy Robotham decided to uh, abandon the research and send samples to uh, University of Marseille to uh, professors Raoul and La Scola. And in 1996, after having stayed in their deep freeze for about three good years. Uh, Professor Raut remembered that, you know, there was something in his, uh, in the freezer that had come from England. And he said that, let's find out what that was. And he decided to, you know, do a, a series of tests. And again, it, they were, it proved, uh, you know, as if there was, uh, you know, there was no confirmation. It looked like a bacteria, but it did not behave like a bacteria. It, it, they won't show what it was. And when they put it under an electron microscope, they found this. These were giant viruses. So these viruses are so large that they actually can cover an entire uh, cell. Now, what was this cell? They couldn't figure it out for initially. And then with some genetic analysis and analysis of proteins, they found that this was an amoeba. And, and the virus that infected this amoeba was something that was so large that you could actually see it under a simple microscope. And soon there were st stories coming from across the world, including India, Japan, Israel, Botswana, where, where they were finding protozoas, especially amoeba, uh, that had giant viruses in them. So since the discovery, since 1996, 1997, a series of giant viruses have been discovered. What is important about this is that this has turned the uh, whole story 
on how viruses may have evolved. Until this time, it was generally believed that the viruses had emerged, uh, what is called the virus first hypothesis. That means the viruses came first and they uh, conspired and, and, and created an environment where they, uh, they actually caused the evolution of the host cell, uh, which is not true anymore because we now know that a lot of genes from these giant viruses are actually uh, are stolen or, or, uh, or carried forward generation after generation from other creatures. And it's an amalgamation of genes that makes these giant viruses so unique. I just want to uh, show you the variety of shapes and, um, and, 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 and shapes uh, and, and, and structures that viruses can have. They, look, they can look like a, a rugby ball, they can look like uh, sea cucumbers, or they can be perfectly spherical or polygonal, or like I showed you, the bacteriophage, uh, which looks like a space lander. Uh, it's designed to kill bacteria. What is remarkable is that viruses can have either an RNA or a DNA uh, genetic sequence. And even within that, the genetic sequences can be uh, entwined, uh, what is called a positive, positively sensed or a negatively sensed um, uh, uh, genome structure. So with such diversity, uh, classifying uh, viruses has been a major confounder. Uh, it is, it is ironic that I've been, I'm speaking at the Linnean Society now because the seven rank classification of the uh, Linnean system has actually now been expanded to a 15 rank system so that we can accommodate the diversity of viruses. And for this reason, I call my book, The Invisible Empire, because there's not only an amazing variety, we also now imagine that for every creature, there should be at least a couple, if not more, viruses. We know that there are about 400 viruses that affect humans alone. So think about it. For all complex mammals and other creatures, if there are uh, a few uh, tens or even hundreds of viruses, imagine the variety of viruses that we may encounter. I'm going to make uh, five propositions or five submissions to you. Um, and these are basically about looking at how my, the microbial world uh, actually keeps nature and na na natural processes in, in balance. And my first submission to you is about the breath. The breath that you and I are taking now is something that has been uh, made possible because of the microbial world. I'm going to show you an image of, uh, of an in Hindu god called Vishnu. Now, Vishnu is a god of preservation. He's called Vishnu the Preserver. The statue is from a place called Bandhavgar, which is uh, west of uh, uh, a place uh, which where uh, Rudyard Kipling actually wrote uh, the Jungle Book. Now, the statue by itself is quite remarkable, but I'm more interested in taking, giving you the notice of uh, the pool that is uh, on the left. Uh, you notice that the pool is pretty still, and but it's covered with something what you and I would actually call slime or gunk or something like that. But it's actually a rich soup of what is called a blue-green bacteria. Now, blue-green bacteria were among the first creatures to evolve. And they are something that are unique to uh, each and every water body. There are unique sets of blue-green bacteria that are found all over the world. I want to emphasize that had it not been for the blue-green bacteria, we would not have free oxygen. About 3.7 billion years ago, the first uh, partnerships between the blue-green bacteria and other uh, bacteria that had speciality in synthesizing and assimilating and digesting other uh, kinds of minerals teamed up 
and started to form colonies like this. This is called a stromatolite. Now a stromatolite uh, looks uh, like a mushroom, but sometimes the cross section when it's broken, like it's here, it looks like a concentric uh, structure. So it's a layer upon layer build up of, uh, of these partners of uh, cyanobacteria and another bacteria. What the cyanobacteria did 3.7 billion years ago was to produce so much oxygen that in about a billion and a half years later, there was uh, so much oxygen produced in the earth that the earth actually froze. The earth also started to have new kinds of minerals like oxides. Before 3.7 billion years ago, there was no free oxygen, therefore there was no oxide, right? So a, a parallel evolution of minerals also happened because the availability of oxygen that took place. The other thing that the, that, that the bacteria did, the partnership um, actually was able to do was to create a ozone layer. Now that enabled the creation of more complex cellular creatures. So from producing oxygen and the ozone layer and also the entire atmosphere upon which much of life depends, the blue-green algae were able to create an environment which ushered in the evolution of more complex cells. But this is not the whole story, not, not yet. If we were to look at the Earth from space, um, it looks blue and green, right? I mean, the blue uh, occupies about 70%. The oceans, the seas, the rivers, the ponds, the lakes cover about 70% of the lands uh, of the Earth's surface. But notice that much of the Earth at the two ends is frozen, largely because of how now the continents have shaped uh, the circulation of the ocean uh, currents and the wind systems. But there's another thing that you need to notice. If you were to look at this uh, map carefully, you would see colors in the oceans. This is the dispersion of the blue-green bacteria across oceans. The top eight meters of most water bodies is dominated by blue-green blue bacteria. Now, you need to uh, realize that there is such abundance of these creatures that they are, they are the single largest primary producers in the world. I just want to digress a little and tell you a, a small story about this. Now, the most abundant creature other than the viruses is this bacteria the blue-green bacteria called prochlorococcus. Now, pro means first, chloro means green, coccus means round cells. And its cousin, synechococcus, are together the most abundant oxygen uh, producers in the world. Just these two species, species of blue-green bacteria produce about 22 to 24% of all the oxygen that is produced on Earth. And there are other blue-green bacteria. So think about it, what vital role just these two bacteria do for us. The other digression that I want to take you through is this, that while we extract our fossil energy, our fossil fuel from coal and petrol and, and other forms and anthracite and lignite, which is made millions and perhaps even billions of years ago, that process of organic decay, compression, and heat took millions of years to make. And that remains submerged. And because the carbon was trapped in the bowels of the earth, its extraction and release has caused the earth to warm up. So it's only logical that if we are extracting fossil fuel from the depths of the earth, it needs to be packed and put back right there. Currently, our strategy of reducing carbon 
whether we use machines what are called direct air captures or carbon scrubbing or planting of trees. All of that leaves the carbon on the surface. What the microbes do in the oceans, the blue-green bacteria, is that they have a very short life cycle. And they produce and absorb the sunlight and the carbon dioxide in the water and in the air. And once they have grown and produced their progeny, they sink and die. What happens then is that as they sink into the depths of the ocean, they stay there. The carbon, the organic carbon, stays at the bottom of the ocean. This is very different from what happens on the surface of land. So the, the, the uh, carbon sinking that happens in the oceans is far more efficient than what happens on the surface of the earth. It stays put, it stays an inside and does not uh, emerge unless it is disturbed. So the carbon sinking that happens and the carbon storage that happens in oceans and lakes is far more efficient and important and a process that we should recognize as something that stabilizes the oxygen carbon cycle in the world. Now, but where's the virus here? That's the question that you may be asking. So here comes the virus. We saw that Prochlorococcus, its cousin, Synechococcus, and Trichodesmium, another blue-green uh, bacteria, which is perhaps the most efficient nitrogen uh, cycler or recycler. And Microcystis, another uh, blue-green bacteria, which uh, uh, absorbs and cycles sulfur. You know the smell that you get when you are crossing from Dover to Calais or vice versa, or any place where you have a smell of, uh, you know, the bracing smell of the sea? That's because uh, of bacteria and the action of uh, viruses, because that's where the activity produces that sulfurous smell. That's something so bracing in, in, the, in the sea or along the sea. So I just want to show you that all these creatures have very specific bacteriophages. Now, to speed up the process of killing, which is essential for both the bacteria, because once the virus infects a bacteria, they end up producing more progeny. But it also kills the mother cell. And that's the, the mother cell that goes and sinks and buries the carbon in the depth of the ocean. Now, this is a story that we never hear about. The efficiency of the virus and the microbial world in the burial of carbon. We only hear about grasses and trees and uh, other measures. They are important. I'm not denying the fact that we should be planting more trees on land, but we must remember that we need to conserve oceans and the ecosystems, the very fragile ecosystems that we still don't know much about. So I hope I have been able to impress upon you that it was the partnership or rather the predation of viruses on blue-green bacteria that has created a cycle of birth and death, but also the uh, assimilation of carbon and production of free oxygen. Now that's what makes uh, all the oxygen possible for you and I to breathe, but also for future evolution. So this is a perfect segue for me to talk to you about the next point, which I think uh, is, uh, uh, is pretty critical. Now, other than the sun and the shapes of continents, perhaps the single largest driver of evolution are viruses and microbes. Now, I'm going to show you some examples from deep history to make my case. The creature on the left is a coelocanth. It's something that was discovered quite accidentally in the Comoros Island. And since then it's been found in all across the Indian Ocean. It lives in submarine volcanoes created by a volcanic eruption in the Indian Ocean. So it's a creature that has been living there. It's perfectly suited to live there. There are very few other creatures that survive in these kind of depths and the darkness in which the coelocanth lives. 
What is amazing about the coelocanth is that it has survived for 410 million years, or perhaps even older. Now, coelocanth, along with the lungfish, are one of the some of the few examples that exist that tell us about the link of how uh, creatures develop the first limbs. Now, if you were to notice the uh, the fin that you can see uh, on the bottom left, it's muscular. Now, coelocanth, because they live in submarine caves, they have been seen that to be walking along the walls of these caves. They also paddle and they have a fluke, a very powerful muscular fluke. Now, how did this happen? How did the ancestor uh, 410 million years or earlier, a million years ago, uh, develop this muscular fit? Now, it happened because of an infection. The, the image that you see on your right is a foamy virus. It's called a foamy virus because once you see the infection, uh, it shows that the cells have actually got bloated and they look like, uh, like foam, hence the name, foamy virus. What uh, scientists, people who study genomics uh, of uh, creatures found that there are traces of foamy virus uh, genes in the genome of a coelocanth. And this is something that is absent in other uh, fish, which are from the same or even earlier, in, which are early, earlier in origin. So what we now know is that had this infection not happened, the first steps on land would not have happened because subsequent infections of bifoamy viruses on other fish, which made the, them uh, to develop uh, stronger muscular fins and thereafter four legs and four limbs, and then finally actual limbs. So there has been a gradual uh, succession of infections that has taken place and which has enabled the fish to evolve into a progenitor of the amphibian, which took the first steps on land and that uh, subsequent infections evolved the physiology of that creature and enabled its movement and further uh, uh, adaptations to survive on land. So that's the first case that I want to make to you. The second thing is this uh, image from about 255 million years ago, the southern continents, uh, which comprised uh, India, Australia, South Africa, Brazil, this, would, this is what the scene would have looked like about 255 million years ago. You'd notice uh, at the background, there's lycopods in the forefront, you see ferns on the bot on the right, you see uh, a palm-like uh, cycad. Uh, the creature that you see on the left is uh, amphibian. It's perhaps slightly smaller than a Volkswagen. But the land at this time was dominated by amphibians. This was the age of the amphibians. The creature on the top right is uh, ancestor of the more modern crocodile called a chasmosaurus. And the creature of interest to us just now is the creature at the bottom right. The one that is uh, looks like a mongoose, but it's not. It's actually a reptile. It's called a Trinaxodon. It's got teeth, which possibly had uh, uh, venom. We know from the teeth uh, that have been uh, found across the Gondwana that they were hollow teeth. So that's one reason why perhaps they had a special gland in which they could secrete uh, a venom uh, and which was useful for it. Also notice the tail and look at the, uh, the claws on its limbs and also the snout. It's all very scaly. So this is a true reptile, but you'll also notice that the skin on its back has hair or hair-like features, uh, appendages. Now, what is incredible about this creature or, or, or a cousin of this creature was that it got infected by another virus and that caused the divergence of the reptiles 
and created something what was known as the mammal-like reptiles. And from there emerged another set of class called the true mammals, which became our first ancestors or our earliest ancestors. Now, the division where the mammal-like reptiles split to create the mammals, the true mammals, also created a subclass or a, or a subdivision rather of what we now call the monotremes, the echidnas, the, the platypus, the, the egg-laying uh, uh, mammals, which actually are pretty reptilian in some ways. For example, the platypus also has a venomous uh, gland in its mouth. Uh, and also it spurs are uh, poisonous. So the, the infection that happened in a creature like the Thrinaxodon actually set off the, the trajectory for creating a modern mammal. And it, what it bestowed was this remarkable organ, which we now know as placenta. So there are placental fish in the sense they're fish that actually give birth and there are snakes that give, give birth. And we know that there are some amphibians that give birth. And they have unique viruses that got embedded in their genes, which enabled them to, to, to have life birth. Had we not had this infection by this specific virus and not got embedded in our genes, you and I would be possibly talking in clicks and clacks and uh, possibly uh, quacking on this call. So the remarkable thing here is that the placenta by itself is an alien structure. It all, it some, in, in very many women, it, there is an auto reject because the immune system of the body finds it to be an alien uh, 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 organ and it does not recognize it. But there is another viral gene which actually, when activated, suppresses that immune response. So most women, therefore, are able to give birth. So had this tandem of viral action and uh, deactivation of the immune system not happened, sustained birthing and uh, you know, generation after generation would not have happened. Now, this is an incredible story, which I think has not been spoken about. And it was only after the Human Genome Project was able to tell us that there are 8% genes that are in the human being that are of viral origin, 8%. And all of them have a very, very significant role to perform, including one of pro product, uh, or, uh, in the production of the placenta. My third submission to you is that viruses and microbes per se have a very, very important role in providing or bestowing forms of defenses. Now, you would be, uh, you know, aghast at some level to say, how can a virus, which itself is an entity uh, or an uh, opportunist looking to infect, uh, want to protect you? Well, it is in its own self-interest, because if it colonizes your body or any organ or any system, it will make sure that it does not let anybody else in. Now, this has been the case with this virus. Now, we all know this virus. Most of us have it in us. About 95% of all humans have had this. Sometimes it has uh, emerged as a disease. Uh, this is called a herpes virus. Now, herpes viruses are encountered as children. You know, when we are children, we get to see them as chickenpox. And sometimes we do not get chickenpox, but we, when we are older, we get another form of uh, herpes virus, which is called uh, herpes zoster, which is uh, something that causes shingles, a very, very painful condition, but it's caused by this uh, uh, family of viruses. Now, we have eight different types of herpes viruses that can infect us. Most people carry two, or some people carry as many as six. Uh, it depends on your uh, geographic and your uh, genetic origins uh, on how many viruses, herpes viruses you're going to hold. What is important about herpes viruses is that once they capture an organ or a system, 
they do not permit very many other viruses that would have otherwise been pathogenic to you. So this is now increasingly coming out as evidence that viruses like herpes viruses have been something that uh, are uh, beneficial to hosts that carry them. Unless, of course, they cause shingle, which is a problematic thing, but of course, it's, uh, it is not deadly. Viruses and my microbes have been something that have been passed on, and they've sometimes jumped across uh, you know, cousins and distant cousins and relatives. This is a 7 million uh, year uh, family portrait of humans and their ancestors. So Homo sapiens and their predecessors are all in this picture. So we have uh, a collection that has been passed down through various ways. And some of them did not reach us directly, but through other means. But what we have been able to do is that we have collected uh, organisms, bacteria, viruses, even worms from creatures uh, or, or our ancestors, our hominid ancestors before us. Now, these are very critical because they not only prime our immune system, but they also additionally, like I mentioned earlier, protect us from several unknown viral infections. This virus may not look like much. It's very diffused. That's because it's been found rarely. It's been studied even less. But we now know that this virus it's a series of viruses that are getting, uh, you know, we're adding at least one or two of them every year. That has been found in uh, just about every organ of the body, including places which we thought were sterile. For example, the cerebrospinal fluid. We thought that the cerebrospinal uh, fluid is absolutely inert. It has no other biological agent other than those that uh, our body produces. But there are viruses, and there are viruses like aniloviruses. This virus uh, class is called the anilovirus. They, pre uh, they prevent, if you have an, uh, a certain kind of anilovirus, the chances of you getting meningitis are reduced significantly. Aniloviruses are also known to protect people with low immunity or immune compromised patients from other infections. So several of these viruses, we don't know why they're lurking there. But the fact of the matter is, they exist there because they provide some benefit to the host. And this is where I think the story needs to be explored of how benefits from the microbial world is currently um, under studied and under appreciated. So I'm now going to come to my fourth submission. And that's about order or rather disorder. If you disrupt the order, you're going to have disorder because this is where the story of the microbes really comes in. Now, until the 1990s or even till early 2000, it was believed that the microbes, there was very little clear understanding on the estimation of how many microbes lived within us. It was only in 2017 that a, a systematic research was done in Israel by the Wiseman Institute. And they found that for every human cell, there were 1.3 microbes in our body. So we have 1 trillion cells that make an adult man. And there are 1.3 billion uh, uh, microbes that are living within us. So one, uh, one uh, trillion uh, ce uh, human cells and 1.3 trillion microbes. So the ratio of an, uh, another 30% of uh, microbial cells live within our bodies. Now, this is absolutely remarkable because what one finds is that as one uh, goes uh, from the mouth, now this is the, the cross section of our tongue and the different colors that you see are actually the different colonies of bacteria. And there's a very fixed pattern in which they exist in every human tongue. It may vary slightly in different human beings and different, uh, and, and different ages. And of course, it changes by age also within the same individual. But the proportions of microbes at a certain age for an individual, by and large, stay the same unless you have really drastically changed your diet. Now, what has been found is that every organ has a specific ratio 
of how many bacteria it holds. Now, this was something that we did not know till about a decade ago. Now, new organisms have been discovered. Until very recently, we did not know the kind of organisms that were living within our tongue, our gullet, our stomach, our intestines, and other parts of the body. Until the 1990s, the dominant uh, belief was that our gut was uh, primarily uh, you know, dominated by this uh, bacteria called Escherichia coli. Now, E. coli is, uh, is an important organism in our gut because it provides vitamin K. It produces vitamin K within our body by using nutrients. So that's the benefit that it provides. But they have uh, Escherichia coli, the E. coli bacteria, uh, which some strains of them are actually very, very uh, pathogenic and it ca causes violent diarrhea. But the good bacteria, the good E. coli that you, resides in our gut is, is incredible because it provides us not only uh, vitamin K, but several other services. But in early 2000, we started to find that the dominant creature was not E. coli. In fact, E. coli makes less than 1% of the gut population. The dominant bacteria are actually these three ones called Bacteroides, Prevotola, and Eumococcus. Bacteroides occurs in people who have a, a milk and meat-based diet with some uh, greens in it. I mean, it's the average uh, omnivore diet. Prevotella and Rumicocus is primarily seen in people who have a high fiber diet, slightly low on protein, but very high on fiber and fruit and uh, pectin. So the ratio of the, the microbes that live within our gut determ is determined by the food. And of course, or how we inherited it from the food that we had as children and from our mothers, because that's how we get inoculated. The bacteria enters our system through breastfeeding, through hand feeding, and of course, through the local environment as soon as the infant begins to crawl. But these bacteria, once they have colonized you, they are there to protect you, and they provide an immense range of services. Now, the question here is that if we have so many bacteria, trillions and trillions of bacteria in our gut, what prevents us after we've had a big meal, for example, from us bursting out with so much digestion and uh, so much cellular activity taking place in our stomach? So that's a logical question, right? So the answer to this is it's a virus. There's a virus that actually keeps the entire population of bacteria in check. And this was not discovered until 2017. Now think about it. This is the most abundant virus in the human body and it wasn't discovered till until 2017. And it was discovered rather by an accident because they were, the scientists were doing uh, analysis of genes from uh, uh, gut extracts and, uh, and from stool. And they found that there was a repeated sequence uh, of viral origin that they could not uh, pinpoint to. And they found that, you know, what could this be? So they called these genetic uh, pieces and they started to piece them together and uh, started to look for a creature that could have uh, a genetic makeup like that. And lo and behold, they actually found a virus that they hadn't seen and they were not looking for it in the first place. And then they found a huge trove of these viruses. Now they called it crass phase. Now it's called crass because it's cross assembly because they assemble the, uh, the genes together and they called it crass, CR as in cross assembly and phage. So the cross assembly phages are the ones that actually control the viruses in our guts. And many of them are very, very specific and they're even strain specific. So they, for each of us, if we have a certain kind of uh, rheumococcus or probitella, and it's a species and a strain, it will be a very, very specific crass phage. So this is an area of immense excitement and something that we have to work towards because if we really want to understand a microbiome and how our systems work, 
this is an area of immense importance. Now, what scientists are also finding is that there is a very strong connection between the gut and the brain. Uh, a lot of uh, diet and uh, negative uh, things that we eat or, or, or consume, for example, smoke or have excessive alcohol, they have a detrimental effect on the vagus nerve, the thing that connects the nerve that connects the brain and the gut. And the vagus nerve is now largely, is now not largely known, is controlled by the gut microbiome. So how you feel in the morning after having excessive drinks or uh, something else depends on how well your microbes have, have been able to uh, make you feel that morning. So it's high time we start treating our microbes better. I just want to take you to another story and I think this might uh, uh, interest Sandra. Uh, this is a bacteria called Ralstonia solanis, solaniserum. Now it affects largely the Solanaceae family, but the bacteria has now uh, actually found uh, very many ways of affecting other families also. But let me tell you the story first. In 1890, plants from Brazil and you know, Central uh, South America, especially root crops like manihot and, uh, and potatoes, different uh, varieties of potatoes were sent to uh, Africa and Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka, and even to uh, uh, Southeastern uh, Europe. When the soil was being carried, this bacteria were also uh, traveled with it. Now, this is a bacteria which actually has a tuft of uh, flagella at its one end, which makes it an extremely agile um, bacterium. And it can travel uh, in rainwater and it loves to travel through splash. And as soon as the raindrops fall on the surface of, uh, of dry earth, this bacteria is the first to actually uh, make the most of it. And it travels from one plant to another. It was believed that in 1890, only eight plants were affected by the bacterial wilt caused by Ralstonia. Today, well over 400 plants globally, including wild plants, including tree species, uh, are affected by Ralstonia. Now, having gone to new geographies and to new biomes and ecosystems, Ralstonia has crossed over and started to cause more disease. In fact, it became the first agricultural pathogen to be added to the US bioterror list. But for every bacteria, like I said, there is a uh, a bacteriophage. There are for every Ralstonia strain a specific uh, phage that can be used to, uh, to neutralize it. The challenge is that it would need spraying of the phage as soon as the first signs of the wilt appear. And to produce the wilt, you need effective uh, fermentation and replication mechanisms. And that's something that has been solely lacking. We have known about phage therapy for a very long time. In fact, from well before World War I um, and before the advent of antibiotics, um, phage therapy was pretty effectively used in Europe, in Canada, in Brazil, and even in India. And phage therapy is something that has to be looked into uh, again, if we really want to get over the challenge of antimicrobial uh, resistance. Let me show you two examples of how phage therapy was used in the 1900s, early 1900s. Now, this is a snapshot from the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club, uh, which was, I think, the eighth album of the Beatles, 1967. Uh, on the right, you see uh, the gentleman in the yellow jacket is John Lennon. Uh, on the left, again, uh, two members of the Beatles. I think it's Ringo Starr and uh, Paul McCartney. Uh, but I want you to notice the gentleman on uh, with the big hat. Uh, he's uh, between uh, Marlon Brando uh, to his right and uh, Oscar Wilde on his left. Now, the gentleman in the hat is uh, perhaps the most famous 
cowboy star of the silent era. His name was Tom Mix. Now, Tom Mix in 1931, in November 1931, was perhaps the ruling uh, uh, Hollywood uh, star. And there was actually no pa parallel to him. Perhaps in the slapstick uh, uh, segments, it would have been somebody like uh, Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton uh, or Harold, Harold Lloyd. But surely in the cowboy uh, genre, it was Tom Mix. He was a demigod. But in November 1931, the advent of the talkies had started and Tom Mix was about to do his first talkie film. On the first day of shooting, Tom Mix did not come out of his caravan and people were beginning to talk about it. He complained of a stomach ache, but many people knew that Tom Mix had another problem. He was an avid chewer of tobacco and he had uh, you know, lost his teeth. And his dentures, whenever he would speak, would clack. And as a result, he was very nervous about speaking on camera. But he did not shoot that day in November. But when he went home that night, he collapsed and fell. They took him to a hospital in Los Angeles, and it was found that he has something, a condition called peritonitis. That means the peritoneum of the, somewhere in the gut has burst. It's got infected badly and the muscle and the collagen has actually perforated. So the infection has actually torn through and it's now entering the bloodstream. Now that's a very dangerous condition to have. You don't know what the organism is and you don't know the real cause of peritonitis. Remember this is pre-antibiotic era. Um, the, uh, the peritoneal fluid is sent to Stanford Medical College, which is the best medical college of the time in, uh, in the West Coast. And as it happens that the person who is analyzing the fluid identifies uh, three or four pathogens that perhaps caused this peritonitis. Um, he suggests that you have to drain the peritoneal fluid and that's the only way in which you can control the fever. The fever is extremely high and you can give medicines to bring down the fever, but the, the infection has to be fought. The professor at Stanford Medical College suggests using viruses. I mean, they still haven't seen the virus 1931 and they have not isolated virus, but what they have discovered is a phenomena in which bacterial cells die as soon as a fluid from which uh, death of certain bacteria is noticed is isolated and put again into a, a culture which has the same bacteria. So what they are able to do is they have such isolates with them and they're able to send it to the hospital where Tom Mix is being treated. And about 15 days later, Tom Mix has recovered. The time in which Tom Mix was being treated all of America, from Al Capone to Joe Lewis, to Charlie Chaplin, to Henry Ford. Everybody was waiting with bated breath, uh, with bated breath for his recovery. And it was only after giving this fluid, which is virus enriched, that killed all the bacteria, the invasive bacteria in his gut and the external portion of his gut actually, that actually saved Tom Mix. Now that's story number one, but here's a story that you can relate to. This is Elizabeth Taylor. This, is, this picture was taken on March 3rd, 1961. Elizabeth Taylor has just returned from Egypt after shooting for the film Cleopatra. She's in London in a Tony hotel and she de develops a breathing problem. And within six hours, she collapses. She's unable to breathe. There's an uh, emergency tracheotomy done in the hotel itself. It's a very skilled procedure, but it was done. Uh, they did not know how to get her to breathe. So what, in tracheotomy, you have to make a small hole here so that the, uh, it's easier for the person to breathe. But the infection was immense. The isolation of 
the lung fluid was done and it was found that uh, Miss Taylor was suffering from a serious condition of Staphylococcus aureus, perhaps the most pathogenic uh, bacteria that we know now, perhaps the most notorious of the antimicrobial resistant bacteria that we have now. It's called Staphylococcus aureus. Now, there are two parallel stories that happen at this time. Antibiotics are the thing to use, but what happens is that the penicillin that is administered on Ms. Taylor is very slow to act and her fever is extremely high. Staphylococcus aureus causes very, very high fever. It's difficult to manage that fever. A company in Philadelphia hears about it and sends a package to the hospital in London and says that this is something that if you apply, if you put it in the, uh, in the lesions that are in the lung, chances of reducing those lesions are high. And lo and behold, just three administrations of this and alongside a new form of penicillin called methyl penicillin is, is done. Now, we don't know what worked. Unfortunately, the New York Times praises the antibiotic. And the lab, the Delmont Labs of Philadelphia is forgotten. Delmont Labs still exists in Philadelphia. They make phage therapy for Staphylococcus aureus, for chronic uh, boils and carbuncles and furuncles and skin infections in dogs and cats. And they do that very effectively. Unfortunately, human use of phage therapy is still not permitted in America. It's only permitted in countries like Poland, Georgia, Russia, and a few other countries. Sadly, phage therapy, which is directed, it's a principle of nature where a pathogen kills another invasive pathogen in a host has now been relegated to the back burners. Now it's high time that we start thinking about bringing specific targeted interventions to conditions like these. Now I'm going to come to my final submission. Now, this is about beauty. We've spoken about physiology. I talked about fish developing muscular fin, and that's something uh, that caused the evolution of, uh, or, or actually drove evolution to the next level by adding new genes and taking away redundant genes or recalcitrant genes. We've created new, new species each time uh, when viruses have mixed these genes to create new varieties. But what happens if viruses from unrelated uh, hosts infects a virus for uh, uh, another host for the first time? I'm going to give you some examples of that. Here's a wild tulip from the Altai Mountains of Kazakhstan. Now, from here, about in the 13th century, the Tulips migrated westwards first to, to uh, Turkey and then to Persia and then came to India. Till about the 15th century, 16th century, the, the Western world did not know about the beauty of tulips. Tulips were monochrome or dual in color. But in the late 16th and early 17th century, tulips from Constantinople went to Venice and from Venice, they went to Bilbao. And from Bilbao, the bulbs went to the low countries, the Netherlands, the place where they actually found their actual beauty. Now, what we know is that the sudden transformation of tulips actually took the Dutch uh, community or the Dutch society uh, by uh, in, I mean, it drove them to a frenzy. Uh, they hadn't seen such beauty. And it's an amazing stealing beauty that you see in, in, in tulips that are actually uh, infected by viruses. So where did this virus come? And why did it happen only in Holland and nowhere else? The trees in orchards, in, in orchards especially of cherries and peaches and other uh, plants, other, other uh, fruits like uh, apricots, 
have a specific virus called a poti virus. Actually, the, the expansion of poti is potato Y virus, but it's commonly seen uh, in trees as well. Now, poti viruses were among the first viruses to actually infect the newly arrived bulbs and flowers uh, of tulips. And these new hosts created an opportunity for the virus to actually infect the anthocyanin, the color pigment that caused the tulips to become even more beautiful. So you saw streaks, you saw feathered uh, designs, you saw spittles, you saw, saw spots, you saw streaks, and you had an amazing variety of very large tulips. An entire genre of still life came to life. In fact, there was such a craze of four tulips that uh, there was uh, the first economic uh, uh, bubble was created because everybody wanted to have a rare tulip in their homes. It became a cause for investment, but also splurging. And soon in a, in a particular year, the infections did not happen and all the bulbs that came out, or most of the bulbs that came out were not streaked. And as a result, the markets collapsed. So the first economic bubble was betting on vanity and, and, and putting your money on a phenomena which was really understood that it was driven by a viral, a repeated viral infection that would happen in tulips. Now, I'm going to talk about wild grapes. This is how a wild grape looks like, right? You see a large peduncle and you see a large pedicel, right? The fruit, the distances between fruits, they look slightly like a spread honeycomb, you know, uh, each side of the uh, honeycomb, the corner of the honeycomb has a fruit. But a viral infection, a repeated viral infection, actually caused the domestic grape to look like this. Bunchiness, it reduced the peduncle size, it eliminated the pedicel. So the pedicel is tiny, they're all bunched together. Now that's something that has been done by a virus. Uh, it also made the, the, the thickness of the grape skin thinner, the fruit pulpier, and the seeds smaller, but also more viable. So the virus, it's like I said, it's not by design. It's a complete accident that such a thing would happen. It's not because the course of evolution is being directed by the virus to create something that is useful to us. It's something that happened in nature, right? So it's a completely blind process. Uh, this is an example of rice. This is a, a, a picture of rice from a place called Jorhat in Northern Assam. And not too far from there, uh, domesticated rice, again, a virus that has put all the seeds uh, together, you know, put it on one spike. Uh, the ripening of each of those spikelets is variable in the wild rice, which is resistant to the virus largely. But the one that has a genome with the virus gene ingrained in it, the timing of the ripening of the spike lips is simultaneous. And that's what makes harvesting simple. And finally, uh, there was a devastating uh, epidemic in, um, in east, uh, an eastern forest belt across uh, the Americas. Now, this is the American chestnut. You can see a car at the bottom right of this gray image for size. This was a grand forest. It is said that a squirrel that could that would be on a canopy of a chestnut tree in Vermont would not have to descend down on the ground and it could just hop from one treetop of a chestnut tree to another treetop without uh, you know uh, getting out uh, of the tree and it could have reached Georgia without a problem. But you know, the, by, by the 1930s and mid 40s, in about a period of 20 years, there was a ghost forest because most uh, chestnut trees in America had died. Very few that survived. Uh, this was because of a virus that came 
from the Chinese or the Japanese, the oriental chestnut that infected the American variety. There was a craze in New York and New Jersey to plant, especially in Chinatown, to plant native Chinese trees because the immigrants had a fondness for Chinese chestnut. And as a result, the possibility of the Chinese uh, uh, chestnut fungus crossing over into the American fungus. In the mid 1950s and 1960s, Italian and French uh, microbiologists discovered that despite the fungus being there in European trees, some of them stayed healthy and the, the base of the tree had the fungus, the bracket fungus growing and collared the entire tree and in American trees that would kill the tree. But in European trees, they were not doing as well, but they tend to survive and some of them actually flourished and they wanted to understand what caused this. And they isolated the fungus and started to look what is the factor that determined pathogenicity of the fungus. And they started to rub the benign variety on the more pathogenic uh, fungus. And they found that the more pathogenic fungus would become benign. And there was something that was transmissible, which made the more pathogenic fungus less harmful. So they discovered a virus that actually modulated pathogenicity. And as a result, there is a possibility that we might be able to revive the grand chestnut forest of Americas. So I'm going to now take a moment and just like to summarize that. What is it about viruses that I've learned? Uh, I started to, I did a podcast in May uh, 2020 and uh, that became popular and people asked me that, why don't you write about viruses and the microbial world? Because it seems that viruses are not so bad after all. So I decided to write my podcast and I translated it uh, or rather transcribed it uh, to in a form of a book that is called The Invisible Empire. So one of the few things that I realize um, is that nothing in nature is wasteful. And the smallest of the creatures are actually the most efficient undertakers, whether it comes to carbon burial, energy uh, transformation, uh, evolution, driving force of evolution. And I think the big mistake we do is calling everything, uh, you know, or labeling things as bugs and critters and slime and feed and gunk and whatever you want to call it. Uh, I find this troublesome because a lot of scientists, including the best journals, I mean, I could name, I mean, articles in the nature or science or scientific American using these terms. I think this is pretty derogatory because it's not doing any service to science. And I think what we end up doing is we create a perception as scientists or science communicators or educators that there are things that are good and there are things that are bad. And that's a very anthropocentric view of how we want to describe things in nature. Um, I think we need to question everything. If we don't find a utility function for a creature, that does not mean uh, it's of no use to any other creature. Uh, there are creatures in, in nature that survive and are doing some function, which we don't understand, but that does not mean that there's no utility function to them. And the more important thing is that we now need to stay curious. We need to understand and understand things from across disciplines and across um, streams. We've siloed ourselves, we've straightjacketed ourselves so much that we don't think beyond the discipline that we work in. But you know, we don't look at consequences. We don't look at the counterfactual. Something that the humanities do better in terms of uh, engaging or why things happen and how do we know about it. Um, sometimes scientists do not do that. And I think they engage in a very, very uh, small sphere without understanding the larger phenomena that might be at play. So. I'd like to thank uh, again, uh, Professor Sandra Knapp and Padma for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Uh, I must preface by saying that I'm not a specialist. And if there are difficult questions in the chat, I will, like Jeffrey Boycott, leave them outside the off stop. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating talk. In the chat are lots and lots of amazing talk, amazing talk, amazing talk. Now, that was really, really interesting. Now, I know there's going to be a ton of questions, so I'm going to try to 
bring them together. But I've, but several people have asked, um, it, when will your will your book be available in the UK, and and how do how do we get it? <laughs> so so we can maybe talk about this, and and then we can we can put something in on on the Linnaean Society website about about how to do that. So so don't feel like you have to answer that straight away. Um, there was there was a there was um, someone you went by something very quickly that someone was quite interested in was about eight percent of eight percent of something within the human genome, and I think that's eight percent of viral DNA in the human yeah. genome. Is it not? Viral, yeah, viral genes. Eight uh, percent of human genome is viral in origin. So eight percent. So the answer to that is eight percent of the human genome is viral in origin, which is absolutely fascinating. When we think of, I mean, we often think about ourselves as being human and special, but actually we're just an amalgamation mostly of other things, which is which is pretty cool. Um, someone has also asked about whether the types of gut viruses um, change following changes in diet long term, or, or or you know, do people know much about that yet? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a work in progress, but you know, early research suggests that yes, it is. Uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a significant change. I mean, if you are a smoker and you quit smoking, or you are, uh, if you have a certain lifestyle and you change that lifestyle, you would be able to alter your microbiome for the better or the worse. I mean, it depends on how how you alter your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is possible. And in my book, I talk about uh, you know the use of probiotics and other things and the use of antibiotics and its harm on microbiome. And of course, Ed Wong's book, uh, uh, I Contain Multitudes, is an amazing book. Of course, it's slightly dated, but uh, it came yeah, about it, four years ago. It's terrific. a fantastic book. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, the, the website of uh, the Weizmann Institute in Israel uh, has a very, very interesting page on your own microbiome. So I would urge you to- Yeah, I'd recommend to anybody who's really interested in gut microbiomes to also go to the Irene Manton lecture, which was um, given uh, at the University of Manchester by a researcher who looked at infant microbiomes and how those microbiomes um, assemble themselves. And that's again, also on our YouTube channel and accessible through the Linnaean Society's website. Um, Someone has asked, where do fungi fit into this whole schema of things? Because you talked a lot about bacteria and viruses, but what about fungi? Yeah, fascinating. I think uh, 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 the book by uh, Dr. Sheldrake is amazing. I'm sure a lot of you have read that. It's, a, it's an incredible work. Uh, again, uh, fungi are special creatures. Uh, they are, uh, I mean, I'm not a specialist on fungi, but I, I you know, one, one thing is what I, what I find absolutely remarkable of fungi is that the cell wall of fungi is very similar to the cell wall of insects, you know, the, the chemical components of it. Another uh, question on Botanical University Challenge is what do, <laughs> what do, what do fungi share that make, make us know that they're more closely related to animals than to plants? That's right. So I think, is, you know, I, I'm not an expert on fungi. I hope I, I, I will be, I mean, but you know, I, there is frankly no need to do a book on fungi, at least by me, because there's such a spectacular book that uh, Mr. Sheldrake has written. And I, I don't think book. I can better it. So, and I really don't know much about it. So I'm sorry, I'm not able to. Okay, that's all right. Um, some of the, so um, someone's also asked, some of the crops that you listed that were made useful by viruses are propagated by seed. So does that mean that the virus is actually integrated into the nuclear DNA? So the virus is actually part of the genome of the plant now. That's right, that's right, absolutely. But you know, grapes uh, can be grafted as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, even wild grapes can be grafted. And you know, uh, it's been known uh, that, you know, wild grapes uh, that get uh, transported uh, by accident can find, can strike root. So that, mm -hmm. that happens as well. So mm -hmm. it's not necessary that it has to be a seed bearing plant. Uh, there are some uh, uh, cone bearing plants or other sporulating plants that uh, benefit from the actions of viruses. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So it could be, it could be in the nuclear DNA, but not necessarily. Um, there's a two-parter question here, and I'm going to ask the um, ask the sort of first part first, and then and then move on to the second. Um, so could you could you use? I'm going to condense this slightly. Is could you use phage therapy to reduce the impact? of things, um, farm, uh, fungal pathogens uh, that harm ash trees and chestnuts and elms is, could you use a kind of phage therapy in that sort of way to engineer a phage? 
Absolutely, I think that. uh, that's what's happening in in uh, Vermont and the place the, the pictures that I showed you. Uh, that's what it's not a phage, but it's a dead, it's a specific virus which is uh, lives within the uh, uh, the fungus. So it's uh, uh, again I talk about it in my book, but you know there's a very nice blog which is done in the American Society of Microbiology uh, by a PhD student on the recovery of chestnuts. Uh, using viruses and it's not you don't what you could do is use the exudate like I mentioned that like the Italian and the French scientists did in the 1950s and 60s was to just apply the exudate on a pathogen uh, uh, so the pathogenic variety of uh, in the American chestnut case is a dark orange or a deep orange colored uh, uh, fungus and uh, the benign one is pale gray so so it's very simple for you to identify it in the field. So if you were to find a tree that's yielding a benign variety, just let it continue producing that, harvest a small portion and start applying it. Uh, I mean, it sounds simple. I'm sure uh, there are more. Probably more almost everything's more complicated than it, is, than it sounds, isn't it? Um, the second part of this question is actually a super interesting one is um, should should we be looking to bulk up the viral bodies of the of these two species in water of this this these waterborne things um, to use as direct oxygen producers and seed the ocean so so is there is there a way of of bulking up some of this stuff to to create more carbon sinks I guess is yeah, kind of I the question. So. The more important thing is that we need to conserve our oceans. I think the, yeah. the viruses and the bacteria are doing their job. You know, we just have to let them do their job. The oceans are no longer and the seas are no longer uh, a dumping site for us, whether for nuclear waste or for plastics mm-hmm. or whatever. I don't think that should be, uh, there has to be a stronger protocol to protect the oceans, um, yeah. purely because we get good free ox- oxygen from and carbon sinking, more importantly. Uh, again, I, let me just uh, say that uh, or reiterate it again that I'm not against trees. A lot of places people say that I overemphasize the the benefits <laughs> of ocean microbes and viruses and underplay the role of trees and grasses. Uh, I believe in rewilding 100%. Uh, but I'm I'm only saying that we need to park the carbon deep into the bowels of the earth and there's no other place for us to do it efficiently as efficiently as microbes who do it on a daily basis so why don't we let them do their job that's yeah. the point i'm making letting letting them do their job is a really good way of putting that well you've been really patient with asking questions i wanted to ask um is is there's one more question that's come in i wanted to ask is your podcast available um, online, the podcast that inspired you to write this book in the first place. It is. It is. It's it's called the Bangalore International Center, and that's the one that actually triggered the interest of other people, and they started asking me whether I'm going to transcribe it. So it's, great. So maybe we'll put that with the YouTube recording so that people can kind of delve into it a, a bit more. Um, now, um, so so someone has asked a question about a virus. And I'm not quite sure, I quite sure I understand this first part because a virus evolved to change plants like tulips and grapes. Is this parable, parallel to COVID, this, this, this particular virus that we're dealing with now? And could this happen to us? W- might this happen to humans as well um, if we don't interfere with it? Um. Because I'm not sure. quite sure I understand. Yeah. I'm not quite sure I really understand the question. Is right. the virus didn't evolve into tulips, and uh, it, it just did something to tulips, um, right? So, and so the, COVID, COVID presumably is doing something to us as well, possibly. I, I think it's a very complex. Uh, it's not going to be an easy answer, and I'm frankly mm. not a virologist. Uh, I depend. I, I'm, I'm a parasite myself. I parasitize on experts and badger them till they give me the right information or at least what they know or what they don't know Mm -hmm. so i frankly don't know the answer to this but uh, what i know at least what i've written in my book is that infections of the past have been very beneficial for human beings of course it's been detrimental also because would have culled out several other uh, you know uh, you know cousins and distant cousins who perhaps did not survive the viral infection right so there were uh, advantages and disadvantages and benefits and uh, demerits of kinds that uh, played out uh, unevenly. 
Um, so like, uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's no easy answer to this because we only depend on the genomes and genomic studies that we have now. And we really don't mm-hmm. have deep genomic histories unlike, uh, but for uh, genomes of say, coelocanth, which we can safely say is, is pretty stable for the last 410 years. Yeah, like it's also true that a lot of this that happens is the product of natural selection and natural selection is something that we cannot direct and cannot predict necessarily ahead of time. So we don't, we don't know. And I just want to thank you so much for an amazing, amazing talk. And Jonathan Drury has written in the chat, what a lovely evening. Thank you, Pranay. You're a star, self-effacing, articulate, knowledgeable, inspiring. Thank you. And I just like to echo that. That's a, that's, that's actually the wrap up of all of this evening and it's been great. And thank you so much for joining us all the way from India. Are you in Bangalore? I'm in Delhi. Uh, joining us from Delhi, even, even better. But um, thank you so much for joining us and giving us that fantastic talk. And we'll put the, we'll put the, um, the link to the podcast and this will be up on YouTube um, as soon as we can get ourselves organized. It often takes a little while for us to, for us to kind of figure everything out. But thank you so, so much for coming along. And I do hope we can get your book in the UK soon. And um, we'll try to get you a UK publisher. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll that would be great. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for a wonderful evening. Thank you, Pranay. Thanks thank a lot. So and much. thanks everyone for participating so nicely. Thank you so thank much. You.